There will be now an opportunity for silent prayer or meditation. Please be seated. Honorable members, order. The only item on the order paper today is questions addressed to ministers in cluster four, economics. Uh, members, Jefferson, before we proceed. Yes, honorable member, why are you rising? I thought we should welcome members of the EFF from the gallery, a future generation of fighters. Let's give them a round of applause. No, Thank honorable you very member. Much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Honorable member, let's, let's not confuse colors with the occasion. Order, honorable members, as I have said. Members may order, honorable members, order. Order, honorable members, order, order. Honorable members. You may press the talk button on your desk if you wish to ask a supplementary question. I also wish to remind you that the names of members requesting supplementary questions will be cleared as soon as the member of the executive starts answering the fourth supplementary question. The first question has been asked by the Honorable Singh to the Minister of Environmental Affairs, Forestry and Fisheries. I now recognize the Honorable Minister. The Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you for the question, Honorable Singh. I have not been furnished with the reports of independent investigations that were conducted on water pollution in areas where farmers are making use of products such as glyphosate, Roundup, although I am aware that a number of regulatory and scholarly reviews have evaluated the relative toxicity of this product as a herbicide with seemingly conflicting results. With regard to question A, it's therefore not applicable. With regard to question B, glyphosate is a herbicide that falls under the definition of agricultural remedies as included in the Fertilizers, Farm Feeds, Agricultural Remedies and Stock Remedies Act 36 of 1947 which regulates the import, export, acquisition, conveyance, sale, disposal, and use of agricultural remedies, as well as the required registration thereof. Because this particular protocol falls under the administration and regulation of the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development, I will raise the concerns expressed with the minister of that department. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Honourable Singh, you have a follow-up question? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Honourable Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Minister, for your response, although it's a pity that uh, we haven't had sight of any independent investigations in this regard. But I think it behoves the Department of Environment, although this is an agricultural matter, to also conduct some investigations on, on, on water streams that may be polluted. I think Thor Chemicals was a classic example where communities from that area complained about the chemicals that were going into the stream. And as you know, Honorable Minister, as government, we have not been able to provide all the citizens of our country with safe drinking water. Uh, and they still use these streams. Children still use the streams in hot summer months where they go and swim. So I think we may have a responsibility to look at some pilot investigations uh, in, in, in some of these areas. It's common cause, Honorable Minister, as you say, there's no conclusive research about the fact that uh, uh, some of these pollutants cause illnesses, but I think it's common knowledge that many of our illnesses are caused by the air we breathe or the food we eat. And nowadays you find producers of food even injecting chicken to make them four times the size so they can make more profit. I see the Honorable Deputy President is smiling, he knows that. So they are force feeding these things and this is how they force feed even our plants with, with chemicals that can cause harm and can exacerbate the risk of certain illnesses. So what I'd like to know, Honorable Minister, is if you would consider some pilot studies in areas where there's huge uh, agricultural uh, industry, 
to see whether or not water streams and even the air may be polluted as a result of the use of glyphosate and other uh, weed killers and chemicals. Thank you. The Honourable Minister. Allow me to discuss it with my counterpart and in due course we can come back to you and advise what decision we've taken. Thank you. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honourable Bahrain. Where is the Honourable Member? Okay, we'll move on. The Honourable Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minister, the glyphosate may have low toxicity, but usually the other chemicals used with glyphosate has higher toxicity and can be harmful to animals. So given the dire impact of glyphosate or the potential dire impact of glyphosate on the environment, is it not time that the department has it banned and propose alternatives, for example, organic non-selective herbicide which can control weeds, grass and broad leaves? That is the question, Honourable Minister. I think I've answered, Honourable Speaker. This matter currently falls under my counterpart and I will discuss it with her. Is there a follow-up question from the ANC, the Honourable Morolong? Honourable Chairperson. Uh, yes. Chairperson. Why are you rising, Honourable Member? Yes, um, I, I, I'm not happy with the response the Minister gave because <laughs> it impacts the environment. She is the Minister for Environment, Forestry and Fisheries. It impacts the environment, it f impacts animals, it impacts uh, fish as well. And she says it falls with her counterpart. That is not, that is not good yes. enough for me. Yes, honourable, honourable members, just calm down. Honourable members, that the Minister have indicated that she will interact and consult with her counterpart on this matter because it's a responsibility that resorts somewhere else. That is the reply. Now, from where we sit as presiding officers, we don't have eternal wisdom to decide if a question has been answered or not, but in line with what the original question was and what the minister has said, that we must give the minister that opportunity to do so. Honourable member, you have had your hand up. House Chairperson, there are questions that are specific to her and to her department. It's the second time she's saying that she cannot give a response, she's going to consult elsewhere. She must be responsible enough to know that follow-up questions that relate to the main question will speak to issues of environment and everything else that has been asked now. But she's not responding to questions, she's just referring to someone else. That is irresponsible. What is the purpose of us coming here? If a minister is going to refer all these questions to some process else, Thank you, Honourable Member. Because we want responses now so that we're able to hold their accountable. Thank you. Honourable Order, Honourable Members. Honourable House Chairperson. No, no, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity now, Honourable Member. Order. Order, order, honourable members. No, uh, honourable members, if you look at the original question in terms of the specifics that the honourable Singh asked, the minister has responded to that. Now, arising out of the follow-up questions, she indicates there's other areas of responsibility that resides somewhere else. And that is fair. Let's give the minister the opportunity to consult and the question may be posed. The honourable uh, deputy chief whip. Thank you, Honorable House Chairperson. I just wanted to emphasize that the minister did respond by saying she gave an honest response by saying that she'll consult with her colleagues in the executive and come back to this house with a response. Thank you, And Member. also, the minister, we cannot allow a situation where I, a minister is being called irresponsible. It's a res she's responsible because she's taking it upon herself to consult. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Thank Chief. Whoop. The Honorable Morolong, is there follow-up from the ANC? Honorable House Chair, there's no follow-up from me. No, you don't want to have a follow-up? Not on this one. Yes. Honorable Member from the EFF, you said you had a follow-up question. Yes, Chairperson, we have a follow-up on what the Deputy Chief of the ANC no, the said. Deputy Chief Whip is that not this minister questions. must not come here to the House if she's no, not prepared, Chairperson. That is seat. a follow-up. No, it's unfortunate, Chairperson. But why are we here? 
Why are we yeah. here to the House if the minister can't answer a Thank simple you. question? It's her department. Thank you, Honourable Member. We are wasting our time. Thank you. Honourable Members, no, I'm not going to allow. You see, this is a question session to the executive. The minister has responded. If the minister gets into a territory that she's not acquainted with and she clearly indicates to the House that she must still consult, then we in the House may hold her in contempt if she misleads the House on information that she doesn't have. So what do you want from her? The Honourable Minister will consult and the Honourable Minister will revert back. And that's where we leave it. Secondly, this is not a question session to other members of the House. You can do that at your luxury outside of the House. This is a question session to the executive. Why are you rising, Honourable Member? Thanks, uh, Chairperson. Can she go outside now and consult? No, Honourable Member, please take your seat. Please take your seat. Honourable Member, take your seat. Take your seat, Honourable Member. I want to move on. Now, order, Honourable Members. Order. Take your seat, please. Honourable Member, take your seat. I've. As boy, can we please get some eyes? Honourable Members. Honourable Members. Honourable Members, calm down. Calm down. Now, Honourable Member, please. Honourable Councillor to the Deputy President, I'm chairing the session. I know you have certain views, but there are rules in the House, and I'm abiding by those rules. I'm not entertaining anyone. Honourable Member, why are you rising? What is the follow-up? Uh, my follow-up, Chairperson, is given that this question paper has been published for two weeks, does the Minister think it's acceptable of her to say that she will only now go and consult? Why hasn't she done so already? Honourable, mem Chairperson. No. Honourable Member, take your seat, please. Honourable Members, I have ruled on this matter and we will proceed to the next question. Yeah. The next question has been asked by the Honourable Bosov to the Minister of Minerals and Energy. The Honourable Minister. Um, thank you, House Chairperson. Let me start off by stating that our commitment as a country to international Order, honorable member. conventions is unquestionable. So the question, therefore, about our policies as a department, whether they comply with the scientific uh, consensus, yes, they do. Uh, every time we develop a policy, we take into account the effect of climate change. The department's policy position is to give due regard for South Africa's current realities of its energy uh, sources. Transitioning into various other forms require careful approach which should be done in a just transition. That is what just transition is talking to. And just transition is a policy adopted in international conventions, take into account that the development level of the various countries is not the same. So our development stage, we're at a stage that should not be compared to Europe, which is fully developed. We are at a lower level of development. And when we develop policies, we take that into account. Is there a follow-up from the Honorable Bosov? Yes, Honorable Member. Thank you, Honorable Chair and uh, Honorable uh, Minister. I am glad that uh, the Minister confirmed his uh, commitment to the uh, environmental consensus, uh, the, the scientific consensus on the environment. For a moment, uh, before the f this latest energy plan was uh, uh, announced, I thought it might be in cahoots with um, highly regarded climatologists like Mr. Donald Trump um, in being uh, committed to a fossil fuel uh, economy. Nevertheless, I think that South Africa with its um, uh, natural uh, adaption for uh, renewable energy uh, is in a very posi uh, good position 
disregarding our developmental stage to really take uh, advantage of the sun and the wind. And uh, as I uh, read in the papers, the minister or the department has indeed again uh, granted exploration permits for fracturing uh, in the Karoo. And we would think that it is much better to have an exit strategy for coal, a very distinct and a very uh, well worked out exit strategy for coal and taking into account all the possibilities uh, with a very short time frame, not uh, taking too much time on that. And then I just want to say that I'm very glad that even the Red Party turned green today. That was a very, uh, that was something I really appreciated it. Thank you. Honorable Minister, do you want to respond to that? Yes. Comparing me to Donald Trump <laughs> is an insult, simple. So I give you the freedom to insult me because privilege of parliament give you that right. But the reality of the matter is our department is not a lobby group for a particular technology. It is regulating energy supply and we're preoccupied with security of that supply. And hence we talk about just transition that there is no way in the International Convention where we should move like a pendulum from one extreme to the other. So we're not going to do that. We're going to be systematic. That's why the IRP, which we must raise, make provision for the various technologies. And it is very systematic if you look at the numbers. What will happen by 2030? You'll see that we're moving systematically in that transition. But we are not writing off any technology, including coal. If you read that IRP, when it talks about coal, it put a rider that it must shift towards cleaner coal energy technologies. The reason that we add that rider is because we're taking into account our climate change commitments as a country. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Shavambu. No, thanks, House Chair. Can, can you, you, you're speaking about climate uh, change commitments, Minister. What, what is the current levels of carbon emissions by South Africa and where are we supposed to be? Uh, and taking into account that we're busy constructing uh, two major power stations that are going to be emitting a burning fossil fuels. Where are we now in terms of carbon emissions and where are we supposed to be? That is the straightforward question. Honorable Minister. I don't want to venture into numbers out of hand, but I will, I will give you the answer, Floyd. I'm going to give you the answer. Uh, Order, honorable members. Honorable minister, let's refer to one another as honorable. Honorable Floyd. Okay, honorable, honorable Floyd. And let me give you the answer. Uh, I don't want to throw numbers and do thumb sucking. But what I can refer you to is that, take into account is that one, uh, renewable energy, for example, was at zero at point X. It is supplying 2.4% of the energy now. Two, you must know that there is a published schedule of decommissioning of a number of coal power, power stations. And that actually talks to the program of adapting to the commitments that we've made. But as we do that, as we do that, before we do throw numbers around, we are making the point that says, listen, if there is a possibility, just transition should not just be cooperatives and reskilling in areas. Because if you close Hendrina Power Station today, you will reduce the capacity of optimum. And then Rina Town will be a ghost town immediately. As we move towards that decommissioning, we say develop alternative uh, technologies to address the development 
of that community and not allow it to collapse. The next follow-up question is to be asked by chair, the Honourable Milam. Chair, 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 on the point of order. What's the point the of order on the member? Not responding to the question that I've asked. How, do we have an obligation to reduce carbon emissions or to increase them? What level are we, are we going up or going down? That is the straightforward question. Honourable Member. If you do not know as a Minister of Minerals and Honourable Member, please take possible. your seat. Honourable Member, please take your seat. We want to move on with the question session. Honourable Milam. Thank you, House Chair. Minister, recent scientific reports have conclusively shown that Mpumalanga has the highest nitrogen dioxide levels on Earth and the second highest sulfur dioxide levels. This is primarily because of the significant pollution emitted by ESCOM's coal-fired power stations. Renewable energy has a major role to play in cleaning up our atmosphere. Now that the IRP has been published and that you yourself admit that there is a supply gap in the provision of electricity, will you inform this House exactly when you intend opening the next bid window for renewable ind energy independent power producers? The Honourable Minister. I get worried when MPs get surprised by things that they are aware of. All the power stations in Pumalanga, all the power stations in Pumalanga have been around. We have 16 coal generating power stations in the country. So they are there. So the pollution by those power stations cannot take us by surprise. That's why it is important that it is not coal or renewables. The commitment is at reducing carbon emissions and other emissions from high emissions to low emissions. That process is going to be a process, not an event. That's why we talk of a just transition. Mm -hmm. So window five, if you want a date for that, no, because, because you're not an MP, you're a lobbyist. Now, I can't deal with a lobbyist order. in Parliament. On a point of order. On a point of order, Chair. Why are you rising? Honourable Minister, will you just take your seat, please? That's it. Take your seat, please. Why are you rising, Honourable Member? Sir, sir it, order. Imp it imputes uh, improper motives on, on the Honourable Milam to suggest that he is a lobbyist and not an Honourable Member of this House. Honourable Minister, will you withdraw that remark, please? Uh, l lobbying is an activity of promoting Honourable something. Honourable Minister, just withdraw the remark, please. You want me to withdraw that? Yes, please. Uh, okay, fine, you get it. Thank you. But Thank you, Honourable Minister. Minister. The next follow-up question, order. The next follow-up question. Uh, Chairperson. Why are you rising, Honourable Member? Uh, can the minister just say if they are opening up no, Honourable Member, for take your seat. Please or not? Please take your seat. It's an important... Honourable Member, please take your seat. We've gone past that question now. House Chair. Why are you rising, Honourable Member? House Chair, my question was very simple. It was, when will the next window open? Well, Honourable Member, the minister has replied. The minister is montashing again, Chair. Honourable Member, you must order. Honourable Members, Honourable Members, you must also... Keep in mind that your questions must be clearly linked to the original question that is there. I've allowed the situation for the minister to expand as far as he could, but obviously, obviously it is clear that the original question has been answered, and in terms of your follow-up question, the minister responded, I can't compel him to give out a date if he's not ready to do so. It doesn't exist. The next follow-up question will be asked by the Honorable Kumalu. House Chair, thank you very much. Uh, Dep I mean, Honorable Minister, given the fact that South Africa's use of coal burning fossil fuels will only peak around 2030 due to the high amount of reserves we have available, and given the, that our new coal fire power stations, Medupi and Gusile, will ostensibly run until 2075, South Africa is, is clearly on the trajectory that will see the greenhouse gas emissions rise in the next decade for they for they taper off and begin to fall in post-2030 and beyond. My question is therefore, more focus should, around, should be around the long-term energy mix plans for the department, particularly the role 
around nuclear and renewable energy resources now, and especially post-2030. How do you then see these sectors developing, and do you intend on deregulating energy supply in South Africa in favor of creating more enabling environment for independent power producers in this regard? Thanks. The Honorable Minister. It is not the independence that generates energy. It is power stations that are based on technologies. Now, IRP makes provision for all the technologies from coal, nuclear, gas, wind, solar, sun, all of them. And the reason we do that, let me explain so that you can explain to others, is that we are endowed with coal in the country. Now, we're the only country, and it's a sign of encirclement, when a country has no interest and needs, but it must be a pawn of the powerful countries of the West, and therefore just repeat their message over and over without looking at its own interests and needs. So, so the point I'm making is that we've got coal, it is not going to be finished in 30 years. That's why in the IRP, we say we'll continue with coal, but we put a proviso if it shifts to more cleaner coal energy technologies. That's the qualifier. So the point I'm making, therefore, is that the new are going to grow. Go to the numbers in the IRP. You'll see that wind, for example, is projected to be supplying 18% of energy by 2030. It is now, together with solar, supplying 4.5%, but it costs 24% of the fuel of ESCOM. It costs 24, it's 4.5% paid for at 24% because the myth that we repeat over and over here is that if there is something new, if a renewable is cheap, actually for PV in round one, we're paying four rand 25 cents a unit today. It's not a wrong one. Go to the banks, uh, they will tell you we're paying 425 for round one, 274 for round two. Only round four has come down to one rand eight cents for PV and 89 cents, 87 cents for wind. It's coming down, but we cannot close our eyes that at this point in time, we source our energy from round one, two, and three, which are all above the average of ESCOM supply. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable Members, before I proceed to the next question, I would like to welcome in the gallery the teachers and learners from Ngobo Primary School in the Eastern Cape. The next question, question 178, has been asked by the Honorable Abram to the Minister of Finance. The Honorable Minister of Finance. Uh, the question <coughs> uh, says what steps is the National Treasury taking within its means to ensure the expedient realization of the goals of the seven priority tasks regarding economic recovery as outlined by the president. Well, first of all, I don't know why the expediency, but anyway. Um, the uh, answer to the question is as follows. Um, the president, in his State of the Nation address in June 2019, outlined seven priorities for the sixth administration. This included one, economic transformation and job creation, two, education, skills, and health, three, consolidating the social wage through reliable and quality basic services, four, spatial integration, human settlements and local government, five, social cohesion, and safe communities, 
Six, a capable uh, ethical and developmental state. And seven, a better Africa and uh, a better world. Now, the National Treasury's mandate is to provide funding for policy decisions in government within the context of its decisions, within the context of its constraints, within the fiscal envelope. Therefore, this overarching mandate, which covers these seven areas, has to be provided for in the budget. And these initiatives are clearly spelled out, <coughs> excuse me, in the medium-term strategic framework. I would like to request honorable members to bear with me, not to preempt the medium-term budget policy statement in terms of what will be delivered next week. Most of the details requested here will be outlined there. Thank you very much. Is there a follow-up question from the honorable Abram? Is there a follow-up question from the Honorable Abram? There's no follow-up question. The Honorable Shavambu? No, thanks, House Chair. So, Minister, you would, you would agree with, with me that whatever form of economic recovery plan requires energy stability and dependability of electricity supply. Yesterday, when we were closing the debate on special appropriation, you said that the challenges of ESCOM is not only about the money, but also the issue of leadership. Do you, do you think that Jabu Mabuza is suitable to lead ESCOM towards provision of sustainable and dependable energy for the recovery plans, whether the reactionary things that we have published and the right-wing uh, proposals that we have brought here, do you think that Jabu Mabuza will lead ESCOM towards provision of stable energy uh, to South Africa? Honorable Minister. The uh, uh, role that Jawuma was a place at ESCOM is that of chairman of the, of the board of directors. Um, and um, he is so appointed in that position uh, by the shareholders. I'm quite certain that the shareholder exercises uh, their mind when they make such appointment. Uh, so Jawuma Buza is the non-executive chair of uh, the ESCOM Board of Directors. Um, on a temporary basis, uh, given the recent resignation of the chief executive officer, the Board of Directors has asked him to fill in the position of chief executive officer until the new chief executive officer is appointed I understand very soon. Uh, yes, very competent. I'm quite certain that will be the case. In order to be able to um, uh, manage this huge organization going forward, I would ask House Chair that the Honorable Member maybe doesn't pose an additional question because he's trying to make me come into the territory of the Minister of Public Enterprises. I know he's thinking. That's what he's trying to do. The next follow-up question is the Honourable Hill Lewis. Thank you very much, House Chairperson. Minister, uh, in that SONA, the President identified the seven priority areas. Later, he identified five core tasks. And at the Presidential Job Summit, he, they identified 77 priority tasks of this government. Now, in all of those lists of tasks and priority areas, very little has been achieved over the last six months, as the President has himself admitted. Now, he says, speaking in London last week, that actually the core reason for the slow pace of achievement in those uh, lists of tasks is government itself, because there's little agreement. While there may be agreement on the goals, there's very little agreement, agreement on how to achieve them. So I ask you, do you agree with the president's sentiment that government is the biggest inhibitor to growth and achieving these priority areas? And if you would... Be so kind as to point out exactly which of your colleagues are the biggest enemies of growth. Thank you. Honorable Minister, honorable members, you are re re um, reminded that according to the rules, a follow-up question only consists of one question and not multiple questions. Honorable Minister. No, I wanted to confirm to the honorable member that, you know, I went to school. I studied. 
I know what the tricky question is. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put you on a coalition course with the president. You are most unlikely going to succeed. <laughs> um, in fact, when I was at the university, I would have said, you are going to successfully fail. <laughs> Thank you very much. Honorable Ngumalu. Chairperson. Oh, sorry, yes. I, I, I think with respect, I have already succeeded. The next follow-up question, apologies, is the Honorable Butelezi from the IFP. Thank you very much, uh, House Chairperson. Uh, my question actually would have uh, been the, similar to the first question that was asked in the follow-up, and I've taken the point that the Minister has mentioned to say next week we'll give more details. So maybe after that, then if my uh, questions were not answered, I will put a question. Thank you. Is there a follow-up question from the Honorable Kula? No follow-up question. Honorable members, let's proceed. I now proceed to question 158 that has been asked by the Honorable Stain to the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. I've also been informed that the Deputy Minister will be answering questions on behalf of the Minister, the Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the question. The answer is uh, the number of title deeds handed out for restitution purposes since the 9th of May 2019 is 27 in six provinces. And the second one is in relation to branch LTA, one title deed was handed over to the Yandela Community Property Association in the Eastern Cape. I thank you. Honorable Stein, do you have a follow-up question? I certainly do. Thank you, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. It's now 25 years since the democratic order was established. But still today, in the former homelands, access to land and occupation of land are still regulated by regulation that was passed by Parliament and other legislative bodies of the apartheid era. It is for this reason that the Upgrading Act was enacted to give black people secure rights in land. It, is permi it permits them to convert their occup occupational rights into ownership. But due to related policy of, of apartheid, that relief is not available to all South Africans. In August this year, the Constitutional Court found that it's unfair to afford redress to some of the victims of discrimination under apartheid and withhold that redress from other victims based on where they currently live. By an act according to your own department, a submission to court, there is no good reason for depriving those in the former homelands the benefits brought about by the Upgrading Act. When will your department comply with the ruling of the Constitutional Court and offer title to land for, to people living in the Transkei, the Siskei, Vietnam, Botswana? Give people the choice if they want title to the land, like the courts asked you. Thank you. The Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you very much. It's 25 years, as you say. And colonialism was more than 300 years. It is in recognition of that particular process that we understand that the construction of a united, democratic, non-sexist, non-racial South Africa is not an event. It is a process that is going to outlive both of us. What is important is that the department and this particular government is doing something to effect the redress and bring an equal society to our people. Thank you. Honorable the, Chair. Yes, Honorable Member. The minister didn't ask the question. There was a constitutional court case that told them to do something and they're not doing it. I'm sure, Honorable Member, if you would have asked that question, then the minister would have been in a position to do so. The original question is asking about the total number of title deeds that the department has handed out for restitution 
and land reform since May this year. What you are asking now in a supplementary question, with all due respect, is a new question. I now recognize the Honorable Tebekulu. Thank you, thank you, Vice Chairperson. Mthonishwa Sela Ngongosha. Out of the number given uh, to your answer, if one may make a follow-up, there is a biggest challenge that uh, the department had of, 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 people, of the beneficiaries uh, uh, preferring to take money instead of uh, 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 acquiring or acquiring the land uh, bought for them. In the very same uh, 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 number of uh, funds that uh, uh, or that we've, we've given, how many, if any, of those uh, uh, CPAs that might have written to the department demanding that uh, they rather uh, be given money and, and, and have the, the, the farms uh, sold back? Thank you. Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you very much for the question. Like the Minister of Minerals and Energy, I do not want to just jump into the figures when I do not have the accuracy of such figures. But generally, what I can say to you, the issue of people preferring financial compensation than land is a very, is an issue that is very vast. You see, when people have been oppressed and when poverty is so much, they really think that the immediate solution to their problem is financial compensation which they can use immediately. But because this government and many parties here have emphasized and indicated the importance of land over simple financial compensation, we continue to educate our people about the fundamental issue of retaining land. This is why we really are looking forward to the issue of finalizing the amendment to the particular constitution. The, your issue is a real one that is facing us, but we continue to educate people about the importance of preferring land which will last forever than financial compensation. I don't want to jump to the figures as I in, <coughs> had indicated. Thank you. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Klape. <laughs> Motlotlegi motlatsa tona re bone mo malobe mafapha a tshwana le a dipuso selegae le kabo ya matlo le fapha la temothuo tlhabollo ya mentse magae le kabo ya mafatse a le mo metseletseleng a belana ka di title deed sentla ntla title deed ke le gona mosola wa go nna le title deed o le mo wa gi wa Afrika borwa o le wo montsho ke wo mofeng ke le bo the honorable deputy minister Thank you. This is South Africa, there are 11 of such languages. Thank you very much for the question. I. <laughs> you see, <clears throat> a title deed can be defined as a legal document providing a person a right to property. A title deed is something that is so fundamental. Upper Kulom South Africa, maybe Maltese Sindhu now. Kubalom Muzolo Unge title deed. Jen Baban Bago Tinje, maybe Bango Kobi Chon. Upon Jebabon in Dow, maybe Zenze Lamacho Chon. Londo lebe benge na yo title deed kunjo zingas. Koto anaka sana bebe vinjo enga bom i title deed. Kukulu mende ongondo kweika. O bebe nga o benga batate linduin. Now, ilondo ke ibalu leki leka kulu umtindo e title deed. Inga gumbi umbuzo ka umbuzo ndogba. What does a title deed mean to a black South African? It provides its dignity to have a roof over your land, a land that you can call yours. Umhlaba onokwazi ukwenza nanto ni nangawo. 
ukuba ufuna ukwenza ukwebo, ungakwazi ukwenza lonto, ukuba ufuna ukwenza nantoni na uyakwazi. Most importantly, no mdongu mama in a new South Africa, uyakwazi in the title deed, akwazi u owner, showing the interest of this government in advancing the cause of an equal society, providing women as equal partners to their men folk. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Ntwedi. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. Uh, Minister, the fifth parliament resolved to, on the amendment of Section 25 of the Constitution uh, to usher in the uh, redistribution of land without compensation. Now, I want to ask the minister this question. Why are you continuing to issue title deeds when we have agreed that land is going to be expropriated without compensation and put all the land under the custodianship of the state for equal redistribution? Is, are these title deeds still relevant, minister? Uh, after having made that amendment on Section 25 of the Constitution. Thank you. Honorable Deputy Minister. Uh, thank, thank you very much for that, for that question. The distribution and the giving of title deeds to our people does not negate distribution of land, the redistribution of land. In fact, it does enhance it. The point that the honorable member is making, I am sure is confusing positions of a political party with what we have agreed on. <laughs> I think that there is total agreement amongst us, especially from this side and the EFF, that land must be expropriated without compensation. But the issue that the Honorable Member Twed is now venturing to, in my little recollection, might be an issue that belongs to a particular political party. Maybe when we begin to debate that, we might perhaps agree or not agree. Thank you very much. Honorable Members, question number 184 has been asked by the Honorable Klape to the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. The Honorable Deputy Minister, 184. Thank you. <clears throat> As uh, the government of, led by the ANC, we are guided in particular by the respect of the Constitution of our country. And the Constitution specifically, Chapter 3, puts emphasis on cooperative governance. Section 41 of the Constitution enjoins us to preserve the peace, national unity, and indivisibility of the Republic. It also provides effective, transparent, accountable, and coherent government for the Republic and its people also speaks about cooperating with one another in mutual trust and good faith by, amongst other things, informing one another of and consulting one another on matters of common interest, coordinating our actions and legislation with one another. Therefore, it is very important for the three spheres of government to work together and ensure policy realignment without encroaching on each other's competence. We note, of course, with concern, allegations of some municipality and individuals intent on hastily disposing land to undermine the process of amending Section 25 of the Constitution. On this, we want to be firm and say, any intention to undermine the expropriation of land without compensation will not be tolerated at all. Thank you very much. Honorable Klape, do you have a follow-up question? Honorable Deputy Minister, the sector is also competing with informal settlements 
which are mushrooming all over and in most cases on agricultural land at local government level. Informal settlements has taken over land for livestock grazing and for food production. What is the department doing to protect and preserve agricultural land at local government level? Thank you. The Honorable Deputy Minister. What, what, one good intervention in that regard that can help us a lot is local municipalities passing bylaws which would need to be enforced. Lack of enforcement can cause the challenges that the honorable member has identified. Also, the effective, the effective implementation of SPLUMA will lessen such a challenge. We believe and are firm that agricultural land must be used for agricultural purposes, not for township establishment. There is a need for strengthening public awareness on existing bylaws, spluma and food security, so that people understand where an area should be zoned for agriculture and where urban human settlements can be, can be allowed, even if it's not urban. In, our, in this regard, you would recall that our department hold, had land reform district committees, which involved various sectors in the local municipality. And this also goes a long way in assuring the effective allocation of land use. This is also why we think that the initiative by our president on the district development model is an initiative that assists very much because it also speaks into the realignment and the working together of different spheres of government. I thank you. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Kebekulu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Deputy Minister, uh, during the apartheid uh, administration, farmers mostly, they had the privilege of owning more than one farm. Uh, in some cases, three, four, five farms. Um, if I may ask, is there a policy now in our department which restricts each farm owner to have more than one, one farm uh, 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 in his possession so as to allow an opportunity for every uh, 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 interested uh, farmer to have a piece of land to produce uh, uh, in this country? Thank you. The Honourable Deputy Minister. Parliament would recall that during the fifth administration, the President then, in a sonar address, spoke about uh, the hectares that each individual should own in our country. And in that regard, there was also speaking of land ownership in our country by foreigners, restrictions in that regard. If we therefore are creating an equal society, we are fighting against a monopoly in relation to land. Because if we allow individuals to own as much as land as they want, or depending on the fairness of their pockets, it will defeat the issue of creating an equal society. Thank you. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Stein. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm noting you're allowing a question that's not linked to the original question, while my previous one was. So my question to the Deputy Minister is, when will government make all suitable state land available for land reform purposes so that we don't have to rely on the different spheres of government to do it? The state must just make the land available. Honorable Deputy Minister. There, there is a process led by, that includes my minister, but it's led in particular by the deputy president of the country. And in this particular process, what we are busy with, and in fact, I think the deputy president spoke into this matter uh, a, day, a, a, a day ago, what we are busy with is exactly, and the process has started, in fact, 
the release of particular parcels of land. And what the deputy president and what we are saying is that we need to rapidly release particular land. So this is under attention. We will be here next week and you might find that there is land that is being released in a particular area. This is work in progress. It's, it's happening as we speak through the IMC. Thank you very much. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Mintwedi. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Deputy Minister, wouldn't it be appropriate for government to put a moratorium on the sale of land until we finalize the constitutional amendments of Section 25 and develop a comprehensive plan uh, on the use of land so that we do not find people sitting on productive land and used when there are people who can put that land into very good use? Thank you. The Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you for, for, for that question. Ideally, that question might be attractive and appetizing. But in a situation like ours, with the democracy that we have, and in that particular democracy you spoke about property clause, it would really be difficult for us to, to say that we would have a moratorium on the sale of, of, of land. This is why, in response to the other question, I had indicated our worry in relation to making sure that whoever sells land doesn't undermine the process of expropriation of land without compensation. But I think it would be difficult for us to say there would be a moratorium passed by government bluntly. Thank you. Honorable Members, question 176 has been asked by the Honorable Mashlauli to the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. The Honorable Minister. The question regarding the finalization of the Petroleum Amendment Bill, uh, actually the development and finalization of the Petroleum Amendment Bill addresses peculiar matters pertinent to the petroleum industry and provides investors with the required regulator certainty to unlock the much needed investment into South African petroleum industry. That is the first thing. The second one is both the object and provisions of the draft bill recognize government objective of transforming the country's economy. And the provisions of the bill will therefore provide for active participation of black persons empower the minister to develop transformation charter for the upstream petroleum industry to further government transformation agenda and empower the state to, participa to participate in the petroleum activity for the benefit of all South Africans. Let me add just one sentence here. We've done benchmarking where petroleum sector is separated from mining both sectors perform better. And we think that if we want the petroleum sector to grow at the necessary pace, we must liberate it from being an appendage of mining so that both mining and petroleum uh, flourish. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Is there any further supplementary question? We are uh, for Shivambu. Yes. Oh, it's yes. <coughs> yes, it's Matlaule. Hey. Honorable Matlaule. Thanks, uh, Chair. Honorable Minister, mm. South Africa's petroleum industry are relatively underdeveloped when compared to countries such as the oil and gas producers in Africa, the Middle East, Russia, and North America. Domestic market is also underdeveloped. What measures will government put in place to ensure that South Africa is able to compete successfully with countries that have more developed petroleum industries and also increase the demand in the domestic economy? Thank you. Thank you, the Honorable Minister. 
uh, the underdevelopment of the petroleum sector underpins our desire to establish it so that it received undivided focus for its development and growth. That is the objective of that bill. Uh, underdevelopment is a function of two things. It's either you don't have oil and gas deposits or you have not exploited them. The latter is true in South Africa. Uh, we were beginning to bump into deposits of gas more and less on oil. And our view is that if we want to grow that sector to its full scale uh, so that it can be optimal, you need to separate it, dedicate resources to it, dedicate people to work on it, then it will contribute to the performance of the economy. Uh, and our view is that petroleum is a catalyst for economic growth and development. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Are there any further supplementary questions to Honourable Kibambu? No, thanks, uh, I was the uh, chairperson. The, uh, so the MPRD amendment bill was passed by the fourth parliament. And the fifth parliament finished before the president could sign it into law. Uh, and, and you, when you were in Australia, are the one who withdrew. We actually announced that the MPRD amendment bill must be withdrawn and the Minister of Energy at that time, Jeff Hadeo, did not even know that there is such a decision because he contradicted you publicly. And thereafter, you, then there was an announcement of total uh, investments in Mosul Bay. Aren't you being a committee that manages the common affairs of the bourgeoisie by, by being under the control of total, <coughs> which said that it cannot continue the investment in Section 86 of the MPRDA Amendment Bill continues, which was basically saying that in all the new discoveries of petroleum projects, the state should have precarious shares of about 30%, and being a sellout and just burgeoning to what the bourgeoisie is starting to do. Honorable Minister. Uh, we are running an economy here, and the policy, please don't be excited, please, 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 and tell us don't be excited, and Mamelani. Uh, our relationship, our relationship with capital is, is characterized properly when you see it as unity and struggle of the opposites. Because, because capital is necessary in the economy we run. That is why if you look to the Chinese model, they observed that socialism in its pure form was very good on the human side, but stagnated on the economic side. Hence, they invented what they call socialism with Chinese characteristics, where they appreciated the importance of free market, the importance of free market and development of the economy. We are in no different situation, where in that situation, we must actually, you see, uh, extremism, which think that capital should be destroyed because it is white, and to call it white monopoly capital, is a misguided ideological position. And we can't help you with your confusion. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honor Chair, the question Honorable is simple. Did you withdraw the bill because of instruction of total? And why did you announce when you're in Australia that Honorable the bill has Shibambu. been withdrawn? Are you a puppet of imperialism? Honorable Shivambu. Please. Uh, can we continue? Honorable Ngomalo. Chairperson, but yes, you must Honorable also Member. protect us here. 
Mkwati, if he's confused by this whole ideology of EFF, he must Thank not you, come here to grandstand here because Honourable we are going to member. expose him. Honorable member, please. Honorable Ngomalo, can we continue? Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, I think then some of us in this house, or rather let me say most of us in this chamber will agree that redress is the key to ensuring that we achieve social and economic justice in, in South Africa. However, Honorable Minister, in, in addressing the myriad of challenges faced by historically disadvantaged persons, in particular in a sector in which is largely skewed to a minority of our population, and acknowledging that corruption is a, is, a fact, is a major factor which does not promote transformation for all, and while we welcome the legislative amendments for transformation to be fast-tracked in the petroleum sector. The question is, could the minister please explain practically how these amendments will safeguard the fact that the many and not few black people who have, who have privileged access already will benefit from these amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Minister. Uh, 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 let's start from here. Let's start with mining, which is where we are taking the petroleum out of. It's, it's one of the few sectors where there is a mine that is 50% owned by workers. That is transformation. Uh, it is in mining where we are in a, on a road to actually put together a mining champion company that is black owned. Uh, the, because We've outgrown this belief that black business must be a 20 million rand business. We must have massive black business that run the economy. If you go to Mpumalanga, if you stay there, you're going to see a plethora of small companies, black owned, young professionals, giving space to grow and develop their own minds. Now, I don't know what barometer have you used to say there's no transformation? Transformation is a process. What confuses many people, uh, including those, uh, is that sometimes they believe that BEE, BEE is a social program uh, which must distribute food parcels. BEE is, a, is about developing black capitalists in a capitalist society. And there will be fewer, it will not be many of them as if it's a social program. It is not, we're developing black capitalists who must grow and, and when black people become rich, we must, stop, we must stop being jealous. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable Mala. Thank you, House Chair. Minister, on a recent oversight... Can I carry on? Continue. On a recent oversight visit by the Portfolio Committee of Mineral Resources and Energy to the various departmental entities, we uncovered significant overlaps in the roles, mandates and responsibilities of the Council for Geosciences, the Petroleum Agency of South Africa, Petro SA and the department itself with regard to the, petro uh, the petroleum sector specifically. Given that all these entities have their own boards and their own organizational structures incurring massive costs, will you commit to merging and rationalizing them into a more cost-effective cost structure? And if so, how? Honorable the Minister. Uh, in the budget speech earlier this year, we acknowledge that there are a lot of problems uh, in the entities of energy. We acknowledge that. And we gave you what we're going to do. But let me remind you, because now in Parliament, that we said one of the problems in those entities is the collapse of governance. And we said to all of you in that portfolio that when we correct 
and regularized governance. We'll be starting a process of dealing with both operational and financial risk. For the self group, we'll finish that now. Now, once you have boards in place and governments, governance is regularized, only then can you start talking about rationalizing because you must rationalize something that is operational. We are in that process on Friday, as we're announcing the IRP, we also announced the board of the various entities in the SEF group. On Monday, we had a meeting with all those boards, trying to show them that, listen, here there is a crisis and there's no governance. In all those entities, let me give you this information for free. Not a, sing, not a single entity there is having a full-time CEO. All of them are run by acting CEO. My responsibility is to regularize that space, ensure that we appoint CEOs to all of them, then begin to talk about strategies. The attempt to come and say, I'm having a, a strategy that is developed by half a board, is, is, to me, is equal to covering up. Then we're going to develop strategies for each entity, and then when we talk about rationalizing them, we rationalize them. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We now go to question number 172, asked by the Honorable N.P. Masipa to the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the question, uh, Chair. <clears throat> the, the total is sixty-eight million nine hundred and sixty rands <laughs> and Seventy cents. <laughs> may, <laughs> may, Honorable Minister, we are protected. <laughs> may I repeat this? Yes, for emphasis, you can repeat it. <laughs> it is. Uh, 68 million 940,967 and 76 cents. And uh, I'm sorry, I've never had such money. You see, that's it. And it was spent on. Uh, 151 projects. There's a table here of the projects as indicated. Uh, I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable Masipa. Uh, thank you, uh, House Chair. Uh, thank you, Deputy Minister. I think the, the numbers that you have given there in terms of the number of uh, uh, clients or farmers that were assisted are incorrect. But, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, it is now planting time and pruning season, and soon farmers will be harvesting. There were farmers that were approved by Land Bank before you decided to suspend this blended finance. Before you establish uh, a commission to investigate yourself, Minister, I just want to ask you to please tell the farmers in this house as to where is the money that you have suspended. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, where, where is the money? It, 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 is, uh, it is not the money that is suspended. It is the blended finance model. The department is very, very busy in recognition of this being the planting season. 
in assisting the farmers. And the farmers know that very well. Two weeks ago, we were together with the farmers in the Free State talking to them about this particular issue. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. Honorable Mandela. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, Deputy Speaker, what measures have been taken in the current financial year to advance the commitment made by His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa to transform the agricultural sector through greater participation of black commercial farmers in respect of the greater participation of rural communities, encouraging the black rural youth to pursue commercial farming and also to facilitate the participation of rural women in commercial farming. Thank you. Uh, the mandate a department of land reform is in the main to rekindle the black commercial farmer which was deliberately destroyed by the 1913 Land Act. <laughs> president district development model U president no kulumende wak. U kete i areas as in da to afuna uku as a pilot kulum dream. Wakalang o r tam. Eyo nando yens ba ketu o r tamboli. Kuba kusema kaya and yenye yen dao e kwaziwa yo through research and other means. Indoba ikati ilele ziko kakulu indlala iyagquba na wayigibisela pha kule veki pheni leyo wakuthumela izigidimi zakhe nangomnye wazo kwakhona kulamhlaba sadibana namafama esiwaxeleleyo into kuba kukho izigidi zemali ezifuna ukuncedisana nabo into kuba bathengelwe I tractor, I'm a farmer, I could. But ton, but ten gelwe, nezindo zogu chala, ukwenze lba bako azi ulil. Sati si senza lonto, sabe si amba nazo, ezi zichalo, nezi zindo, sababo ni sindo ba mabangene, ema simini basebez. Okwa simini, sabo ni sa indo kwa kubalu lekile. Deputy Minister. Kobela, kobela nza upomo nyomzuzu. As the first line of defense against Indala and Gosrakul. Sabon, Minister, Deputy Minister. Uh, Honorable Sabakul. Estrozella is Amber or Sir Tulay or Sabanda Abashum Lille, Uktugiswa, Wezo Lemo. Umanga Bege Umdo Elande La Pande, Tonchasella and Patiso. Axbona Bonga Bapumela. Nain Lizens Ele Tile, Abashana Bezanas. Mshan Pege Gulesi is Amber or Snegazile, Enanin Lalabo Abashum Lille Russo. Bangagi, Paratuabo, Abateba Sebens and Pumelelo, 
Bangena M Kaken was only more, but so that Bakit and Pumelelo, Bangag, Ababa, Abato, Tobale, and Leleni, Ubia Pambi, and Yin Umyang or Selayo, Ubia Pambi, Lubalega, and Utia, Ector Tobalan Wabo, Basum by Pambi, nothing at all. Thank you, Honorable Member, Honorable Deputy Minister. Engosi, Engosi, Mdonekas. Eh, all Uneto Silunikayo. Banizi kakulu abantu abafumeneyo kulo. And the situation je aiteti indogba aziko ingaki esi tibana na zonjilin. Zininzi kakulu ingaki esi tibana na zonjilin. Ezi nye zezo ngaki. Zipai bantu ndibakuti. Ezi nye zezo ngaki. Zila papaka achiku department. Na kumakosa eitu. Any years in those ballet layers on bar, Sifuni and Isaka cool. In Dogba, Sikwazi Uilandela Imali, Tassi Fagi Limali, Sikwazi Uilandela, Yilondo, Sifune, E unemployed agricultural graduates, Kulo, Kuo, Hong Kong, South Africa, Kuan Zelba, Sikwazu, Kuan Zalan, Doktuangis, Kumonitarisha. Got to Ba wabentela unjikone le kule nda uyokuba i percentage tini. Tinga kwa azuila ndeli salombe nyulolo in a written response. Ukwa zelba, tinga katile inu, tiabulela. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Deputy Minister. We still have one spot left. Anyone for the taking? Honorable Member, see your hand. Thank you very much, House Chair. The program on the commercialization of black farmers was announced by the former president, uh, the former delinquent in 2014. Three years later, three years later, funds for the program were appropriated by the current president. Now, in our committee meetings, minister, in your presence, your department has said that they are yet to finalize the framework for commercialization. And yet you are giving a response in Parliament today that you have spent around 68 million on that program. Did you spend the money before the framework for the program is finalized, Minister, or you were just giving those figures for the sake of answering a question posed to you? And if so, how did you go about selecting beneficiaries? Because I believe the framework would also speak to how beneficiaries on that program are going to be selected. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Deputy Minister. Imbazamo, ukuti, e-commercialization of black farmers. Imisi, wabukundwe ilinde leyo. The commercialization of black farmers is an ongoing process. It has started, it's continuing as, as we speak. Strengthening the relative rights of people working the land, popularly known as 50-50. program, Liana, a tata, umtu osebenza, a farmer, umsebenza, if that is not commercialization and umkwais in Dogba, Abe Namaja, then Kaban has a commercialization. So he process a Kubega Yongok. Ia Kubega, I miss Wanga, Indo a Kubega Yongok in Jabulen. Sabon Question number two. Hundred and fifty five has been asked by the Honorable Shivambu to the Minister of Finance, the Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the Deputy Chair. The question <coughs> uh, is as follows uh, Whether certain persons uh, contributed to the National Treasury Economic Paper, not titled, entitled, 
economic transformation, inclusive growth, and competitiveness towards an economic strategy for South Africa? Uh, if so, what was their role? And then the names submitted for these certain persons um, are those of Professors uh, Ricardo Hausman and Robert Lawrence from Harvard University. Uh, Honorable Shuang. Um, but I think you forgot to ask to add the Professor uh, Danny uh, Roderick. Uh, and the question is, have they contributed to us the paper? The answer depends on how you define contribute. <laughs> because you can contribute in various ways. You can contribute by drafting a paragraph or adding a comma and so on. Or you could contribute by entering into a debate and a conversation that enriches the th thought process. Um, uh, others could contribute by uh, paying for the venue of a meeting or something like that. Now, in this instance, I think what you are getting at, since I know you from the Youth League days, what you are getting at <laughs> is a view that the paper was written by Harvard professors, which is false. Now, <clears throat> I, uh, if we have time, I wanted to read the uh, people who participated at the three colloquia that we organized um, at the South African Reserve Bank, which colloquia may have contributed to the ideas process or may not. But I think they probably contributed to enriching the, the thought process. Now, there were only three Harvard professors. The rest, South African professors, some of them from your university, but uh, from Stellenbosch University, Free State University, and others, uh, while some uh, were private sector economists, government um, economists, South African Reserve Bank economists, um, farmers, uh, uh, farmers, for example, from ZZ2, uh, and so on. So, <coughs> yes, so ideas were contributed because the thought processes are not static. But uh, I think there is uh, some kind of intellectual inferiority. Because of Harvard universities, therefore, it is only the Harvard universities that contributed. And yet there are these other South African academics who contributed. But because you are scared of the Harvard professors, you uplift them higher than the others. The fact of the matter is that there were other professors as well, including some who, who, who might have taught you and you didn't pick up what they taught you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable Shivamba. No, no, thanks, uh, Chairperson. Like, there certainly is no professor who taught me who contributed to the neoliberal perspective that they released. And the, the context of why we're asking the question is because Ricardo Hausman is an associate professor, is an associate for the Center for International Development in Harvard University. And the key funders of the CIB it's Investec Asset Management, the Standard Bank, is uh, George Soros Open Foundations. And some of the ideas that are contained in that perspective are in Investec economic policy perspectives. So basically, Investec takes its perspectives about the restructuring of ESCOM, feeds the, feeds the Harvard professors, and then they come and feed you, and then you call that expert advice. And in this context, Investec stands to benefit out of the whole unbundling of ESCOM as is proposed here. So the question we're asking is, and, 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 and to being again like a Gwede, a Minister Gwede, being a puppet of, of 
the capitalist establishment that is imposing its views through so-called intellectualism. Because there's truly nothing intellectual about the perspective. It's just new liberal drivel that has been repeated many times that you privatize, you let the state not participate in everything else, and therefore there's going to be growth. That is the context out of it to say that you are now taking domestic capitalist perspectives on how the economy must be restructured, and then you bring back those perspectives as if it's some expert advice from Harvard, which it's not. That is the context within which we're asking this question. Honorable Minister. Um, <clears throat> I know that we all have different uh, ideological positions. Um, and so if you want your ideological position to to govern, you first have to win elections. So you can't expect the EFF ideological position to be that of the ANC, it's not. Um, so you have to win elections first, maybe manage Johannes back better. <laughs> Now, I indicated to you that the three Harvard professors were only three amongst many who attended. But you are hung up about Harvard because of your intellectual inferiority to Harvard. Yes. Because why not worried about uh, uh, these other South African professors? And three people out of over 50 professors are a problem to you. Now, the issue about who funds who, uh, it's not the issue that you ask me. For example, do, do I ask who funds the EFF's writing skills? I don't ask you that question because it's your business whether it's the VBS or who else. I don't ask that question. Whether you have repaid the VBS money or not, I haven't asked you that question. Until maybe I release the forensic report. Then you'll be in trouble. So focus on the many people who participated in the conversation and not pick up on Professor Houseman alone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Honourable Shanga. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. Honourable Minister, the economic paper in question is most certainly will come and move to the right direction uh, for our country and, our, and the strategies outlined there are very clear, simple, and all that is needed from all stakeholders to implement them to the latter. Then the question is, how does the minister intend to mediate the opposition to his plan? In particular, how do you intend to rally support with the, ANC, uh, uh, with the ANC alliance partners who have come out against this plan, but who in this regard should be at the forefront in driving transformation and the employment and the labor sector? For example, during the era of uh, President Tabombeki, which put forward the GEAR strategy, when the labor unions took it to street, that was the end of the, that strategy. Are we going to see the same with this one? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable the Minister. Yes, the... Uh, uh, <coughs> the rallying of uh, support for this work is very important. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, policy at the end of the day is politics. Uh, you can't separate the two. Uh, and politics has to provide the, the leadership. So we have been involved in conversations with the uh, leadership of the ANC, the, uh, business leadership, and all other leadership 
that's relevant to rallying the support for, for this work. And um, uh, most certainly I've had conversations with the National Executive Committee of ANC um, um, for almost the whole day. Um, the Economic Transformation Committee of the ANC has discussed these issues. Um, but I suppose at the end of the day, uh, the ANC has to make a decision what to do about it. And being at the, uh, at the head of the alliance, uh, I'm sure the leadership of the ANC here uh, will be able to carry the necessary processes. But time is of the essence. Um, and some things can't wait. Uh, we have to proceed. Let me give an example. Um, we say that um, there are two uh, sectors of the economy which could be um, labor absorptive. Agriculture, which we've just discussed, uh, with the millions the minister <laughs> was reading. Congratulations, minister. Um, <clears throat> and tourism. Now, take tourism, uh, and we have had this discussion before, where we say that uh, uh, tourism is a, a low hanging fruit, and therefore we should move with speed to support tourism in the job creation endeavor. And the uh, speed with which we issue visas to tourists uh, who want to visit our shores uh, is important. And the Minister of Home Affairs uh, is becoming a big ally of mine in making sure that we get the visas sorted out and uh, get rid of all these abridged uh, birth certificates for children and so on. And he's already moved ahead. So we're not waiting for some future date to start the implementation. It's a progress in action. Uh, so I'm very pleased that we're making progress and uh, uh, say take the issues on the network in the networked industries, uh, that's transport, uh, communications, and so on. Work is going ahead there. The issue of the issue of the spectrum. Uh, hopefully, the members from the EFF here know what the spectrum is. So that. Uh, <laughs> is happening and um, um, in the process, you know, getting the momentum uh, going. So I thank you very much for your question and the opportunity to elaborate a bit and, and, and educate some members in red. <coughs> thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, so pay more along. No, Chair, I wanted to confirm that oh. as we don't have conceptual Honorable. confusion, we understand Honorable. spectrum allocation. Honorable Doc. I thought particularly uh, the rolling out of the coming Honorable 5G, 5G generation. It, it's Honorable very easy, Dose. but we are not from Harvard. We don't Honorable have to outsource Dose. our thinking to Harvard. Honorable Ndozi. No, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, no, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Minister, in the spirit of participatory democracy, which is enshrined both in the Constitution and in the Freedom Charter, on the 27th of August 2019, the Ministry of Finance called on the members of the public to make comments on a paper titled Economic Transformation, Inclusive Growth and Competitiveness Towards an Economic Strategy for South Africa. Can the minister enlighten the South African public as to how has their contribution strengthened this economic paper? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable the Minister. Uh, thank you very much for that question. The answer to your question is that there were over 800 uh, submissions um, uh, responding to the request we had made to the public. Now, the basic approach that we took was that those contributions which are 
internally consistent with the direction of the paper uh, will be incorporated. But those which were internally inconsistent will be acknowledged, but uh, yeah, it was nice, uh, but uh, not helpful. Um, so we are in the process now of incorporating that which is internally consistent. Um, and uh, some of them very, very useful uh, comments. Um, but if a comment, for example, says, uh, my contribution is that this paper is neoliberal, is so George Soros, and so on, that is internally inconsistent. <laughs> and therefore not helpful. Um, or uh, somebody says, the macroeconomic policy that must underpin this paper must be the abolishment of inflation targeting. That's internally inconsistent and therefore will not be taken into account. So we appreciate those who have uh, made contributions which are internally consistent with the paper because they strengthen the paper and we very much appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We now move to question number 187. That has been asked by the Honorable P.M. Manele. It's only now that it's appearing. It's appearing. I, I was just about to skip Honorable Stian Asian because he's not here. But uh, at least has just appeared. No. Thank I you. Therefore, no. <laughs> Thank you. He's he's attending an inconsequential meeting elsewhere. As we uh, Minister, thank you. I agree. I think this, as a general rule in South Africa, our position should be that the quality of contributions should be more important than the identity of the contributors. And I'm glad to hear that you agree with that position. Now, one of the people who did contribute was actually the Honorable Kruger from the DA, whose private member's bill, the Red Tape Reduction Bill, is actually uh, listed as one of the things that needs to be implemented in your paper, and which obviously we support. So, and that contribution is internally consistent uh, with the rest of the paper. So my question very simply is, when will that bill, which was last year voted down by the ANC, but which we are very happy to reintroduce at a moment's notice, when can we reintroduce it and get it to this House as quickly as possible? Thank you, Honourable, Honourable the Minister. I, uh, <clears throat> I think you should take advantage of the questions to the Deputy President, maybe next week, to ask that question because uh, I don't think I'm at liberty to, to, to do that, but he, he will. We've, we're making progress uh, in that direction, I think. But I'm not quite sure we're making direction towards a private member's bill or making direction towards an executive uh, bill. I think more towards an executive bill. And, uh, but the Deputy President, I'm sure, will deal uh, with, the, with the question. Um, and... Uh, Maybe we should avoid uh, standing on rooftops and claiming that this party made that contribution. Uh, it might not be helpful uh, at all. So uh, let's not stand on any rooftop. Let's just do the work that needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable the Minister. Question number 187 has been asked by the Honorable PM Manelli to the Minister of Communications. Honorable the Deputy Minister. Thank you, Honorable Chair. The question relates to the SABC's capacity to comply with outstanding preconditions from a national treasury, including the sustainability thereof. And in our reply, Honorable Chair, we are saying as the department, the outstanding preconditions relate to the separate reporting in terms of public commercial services 
and public broadcasting services, as well as identification of non-core assets and the public-private partnerships. So the SABC has developed a turnaround strategy with the assistance of Government Technical Advisory Center, which we call GovTech, which incorporates a variety of initiatives that will be implemented in order to address all the governance, operational, and financial inefficiencies within the organization. And in order to ensure that the 2.1 billion rand funds allocated to the SABC is utilized for its intended purposes, the SABC executives will provide the departmental task team with monthly progress reports with effect from November 2019 on the implementation of the turnaround strategy. And in this process, Chair, the SABC will also be required to report on the progress made in addressing the concerns of the government with regard to three outstanding preconditions that must be fully complied with by March 2020. So government is satisfied that the SABC has fully complied and um, based on some of those things that I've uh, related to before, the public broadcaster has demonstrated commitment to enhance supply chain management processes, to improve and, and implement all its turnaround strategy accordingly, but also to deal with issues of consequence management and fully capacitate the organization with the required skills and competencies. Um, in addition, Chair, uh, the department has also developed a plan to pursue policy and regulatory changes to address market failures that may be seen as negatively affecting the public broadcaster. So we are, in a way, working towards the regulatory framework that needs to be addressed, which can also address the issues that the public broadcaster is concerned with. So, so far, we are satisfied, and thanks very much. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. Honorable Manelli. Thanks, House Chair. Deputy Minister, the comprehensive uh, response you've given does give assurance to South Africans that efforts are being made to get the national broadcaster back to its feet and that South Africans can have confidence once again. However, the issue raised by SABC a number of times relates to high employee costs. What is the view of the department on reports of high employee costs at the SABC which may lead to retrenchments of staff going forward. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Th Chair. Honorable Chair, thank you very much. I think the issue of bloated um, um, SABC and government, it's, it's, it's the issue of personnel being or institutions being bloated, it's not unique to the SABC. And we have sat with the board to say, Let's do skills audit. Before you even arrive at uh, section 189, let's deal with the issue of skills audit. Let's look at options of reskilling and upskilling, but also look at other areas that we can assist employees so that we don't take retrenchment as the first option. So the SABC is looking at the totality of all those things so that at the end we are able to respond accordingly. So the issue of uh, retrenchment, it's, it's something that is unavoidable, but it has to be informed by realities that the SABC shall have arrived at. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. The Honorable Swart. Thank you, House Chair, and thank you, Honorable Minister. Arising from your response, the ACDP played a key role in the SABC inquiry in the fifth parliament, and we note your progress report on the conditions for the 2.1 billion rand bailout. 
particularly on the monthly progress reports as well as the supply chain management, and we welcome those, and we as Parliament will also be exercising oversight in that regard. But one of the areas of concern is the payment of royalties to musicians and others who have rendered service to the SABC. Now, whilst this is not directly arising from your response, would you um, care to look into this issue? Because we understand the SABC collects the royalties and holds them, and it is not being paid over to the musicians. And would you, is that an issue which you would look into? Because clearly many of the musicians are struggling in the economic environment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you, Honorable Chair. And thanks, Honorable Swartz, for the contribution you made in your, as, as a member of the committee. The payment of royalties, um, it's, an, it's a thorny issue. We have been engaging IMPRA and SAMPRA and all other organizations, not only us as the Department of Communications, but together with the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. And there was even an interministerial committee uh, before my time that was led by Honorable Buti Manamela, the, de the current Deputy Minister of Higher Education. We have picked up on all those things and not only does it concern our um, normal SABC radio stations, it also affects IMPRA, SAMPRA, and all other organizations, even on community radio. So we want to develop a comprehensive approach to respond to some of those, and it's an issue that the Ministry of Arts and Culture is leading in this respect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Ndoze. Honorable Ndoze. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the last time, the last time I checked, I'm Honorable explaining. I'm, ex I'm explaining to you, Chair. Uh, the last time I checked, we're not Honorable Ndoze. Okay. I, I, uh, my name, my name is Panam uh, I'll be standing in for Honorable Ndoze but it has to be arranged with a table. Yeah. Uh, honorable, honorable, honorable Ndozi, it has to be arranged with a table. We, we apologize profusely. So I'll give you a chance next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, the turnaround strategy of the SABC was crafted by the Department of Finance with the help of GTEC, which is not an expert in anything. In fact, the Department of Communication seems to run to finance for anything that has to do with that department. Now, the department has misdiagnosed the problem at the SABC. One of the conditions that the SABC has not been able to meet is the issue of selling off of assets. Assets which the SABC itself has admitted that they cannot uh, sell off because it would then impact on their competitive edge. The competitive edge of the SABC, as the industry agrees, lies in its ability to control the platforms on which it, 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 it broadcasts its content. And that has to do with digital migration. Now, when is the department going to stand up against the Department of Finance in, in, in the, on the issue of digital migration and on these conditions that it, it, uh, it imposes on, on the SABC? so that the SABC can have its competitive edge and succeed. Thank you, Ndadem Kwena. Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I think uh, I need to put it categorically, Chair, that the turnaround strategy was developed by the SABC itself. The, the fact that the SABC developed that turnaround strategy and Treasury came to be involved was because they needed 3.2 billion rent and Treasury wanted to satisfy itself whether the turnaround strategy and what the SABC want, there'll be value for money going forward. That's one. So Treasury, by all means, will be involved because we need to uh, protect uh, taxpayers' money. So that's one. Two. The issue that um, the SABC was unable to 
deal with um, uh, selling of assets and other related things. Remember, I said when I presented, there were three preconditions. One speaks to public broadcasting services. That is your current radio stations, Uko, Zitovela, everything, everything. The uh, SABC needed to separate how they uh, report on the commercial aspect and the public aspect. The commercial aspect, it's your radio station, 5FM, Metro, and other things. So Treasury said, don't put them, don't club them together. You have the public mandate, you have the commercial mandate. Separate, let's see whether there's, there's, there's the commercial aspect of the SABC is making money. The same applies to non-core assets. Non-core assets will include land that SABC owns. It will include all other things, including TV channels that the SABC or radio channel, radio uh, 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 broadcasting opportunities that are there that may not be making money to the SABC. So SABC has to look at those and then say, here we can do PPP, here we can do lease, and here we can do build, operate, and transfer. So those are the things that the SABC is doing, and it falls under the precondition. The issue of digital migration, it's something that will also assist and enhance SABC to also explore other platforms other than your regular uh, uh, platforms of radio and TV that are currently operating and be uh, also able to play in the digital space. And that's what the SABC is preparing for now, to also be competitive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. Honorable Majose. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, we, we welcome your intervention, Deputy Minister, the Department of, uh, of Communications, in, the, in making sure that the SAPC will then follow all the preconditions that uh, are left out. But however, Deputy uh, Minister, I would like to know, as the SAPC now wants to increase the TV licenses to poor South Africans, who are subjected to air shows and programs of decades ago. What is the department's take on this one, especially on the economy that is facing South Africa right now? Thank you. Uh. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Majosi. I think as South Africans, we, we also have to take the issue of the survival of the public broadcaster very seriously. For years, the SABC has not been increasing its licenses. And if you look at uh, what we are seeing in all our areas, I mean, and I, I give pride to our people because even in in formal settlements, you see many people have migrated on their own. You see satellite dishes. I mean, by mere seeing a satellite dish, it means a person has migrated from analog to digital, and, and thanks to South Africans. But we are also saying that is pay TV. We are offering free to air, and we can give you six to 11 platforms for free. So assist the SABC by paying. Part of it of paying the license is to bring new content into the SABC so that we don't bring back Mupeme, we don't repeat other dramas, but we bring young people in the creative industry to bring new content. So. Payment of licenses will be critical. Thank you, Honorable uh, Deputy Minister. The next question asked to the Minister of Employment, Labor is question number 182, asked by the Honorable Dr. Nkabani. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, Slav. Well, the Department of Employment and Labor acknowledges the wealth and the contribution by the various stakeholders in trying to find solutions to youth employment and in addressing the, the problem of those not in education, um, employment, or training, we call them the NEET. Our plans are based on the observations and recommendations made in the National Youth Policy, the Youth Accord, the HSRC report, and other studies and policy recommendations. As we reorganize the department in line with the new mandate, we're building on the existing policies and work closely with other departments, the youth sectors, institutions of learning, the non-governmental organizations and international community and the private sector uh, in efforts which are aimed at uh, improving of the education and training opportunities to close the skills gap and to facilitate the transition between school living and first employment. We also refer work seekers with low skills levels after assessing them to the public employment services and uh, to the Department of Higher Education, Science and Technology, the CETAs, the TVETs, and other private institutions. We are also supporting some of these initiatives through the UIF Labor Activation uh, Program Fund and the Compensation Fund, and connecting the young people with employment opportunities through other free work seeker recruitment placements, through what we call the public employment services, youth centers, and the private employment services, career centers, career counseling, uh, employment scheme work readiness, promotion programs, and providing young people with uh, the work experience through learnerships, apprenticeships, and internships. And increasing a number of the young people employed also in the public youth program, such as the known EPWP, the National Youth Service Community Works Programs, the NARISEX, the youth brigades in the green, the fire, environmental health, and literacy maintenance. We are also empowering uh, the youth, women, and people with disabilities through the targeted set-aside industries and uh, the public sector. We have about eight factories now in the provinces, strictly which are run by the people with disabilities. So the promotion of the youth entrepreneurship youth cooperatives and SMEs. It's part of the program. So that collaborative effort between the public and private sector to expand the intake of the young people through these initiatives, such as YES, Harambi, Gauteng talks about CEPO 1 million, and other interventions funded under Job Summit and the Employment Insurance Fund and the Compensation Act. We are currently developing, of course, the labor migration policy that is to assist in the regulation of the employment of the foreign nationals and to complete uh, the Immigration Act to guide the review and the conclusion of the bilateral, um, bilateral government labor agreements, the skills transfer in case of employment of the needed desk uh, skills. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, <coughs> Honorable Minister, Dr. Nkavani. Who's taking the question? Oh, Dr. Okay. Danji is taking the question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Honorable House Chair. It's a prophecy. I will follow the route to become the doctor. Uh. <laughs> uh, Honorable Minister, as you've mentioned that you will, you will build on existing plans and policies to address the employment that would be designated as not requiring scarce skills. When are you anticipating to finalize the development of the labor migration policy that will regulate the employment of foreign nationals and the employment policy? And also, how will you ensure that the existing initiatives and programs are assessed by the rural communities, as in most of the cases, they are the ones who are left out? Thank you very much. Thank you, honorable member, honorable uh, minister. The, the labor migration policy, as per our plans, 
will be completed before the end of the financial year. We are at a stage where we are reviewing the draft document and once we have completed that, we have to send it to Inetlec, where all the social partners will have to comment on that. And then after that Netlec process, it will go into, into cabinet. Well, our, our plans and projections are that before then, the end of the financial year, we should have done with that and have come to parliament. And in terms of the employment policy, we are developing this. Um, maybe in 12 months we'll be having that, but we must emphasize one thing. Once you talk about the employment policy, as our economy is extending and trade to the Sadek region and even to the continent, we also need an employment policy for the region, not just for South Africa. Uh, that's, that's the reality which we're talking about. In terms of extending these services to the rural areas, our 126 labor centers, which are helping the young people, we are extending them into the rural areas and would like to add more so that uh, we have more in the, in the rural areas. Thank you. Thank you. The next follow-up question will come from Honorable Kado. Honourable Minister, the Department of Employment and Labour should be trying to make it easier for businesses, particularly small businesses, to absorb relatively unskilled workers into productive employment. With that in mind, do you support the proposal put forward in Treasury's recently released economic strategy document that government should consider full or partial exemptions for small businesses from certain labour regulations? In particular, do you support exempting small businesses from the extension of bargaining council agreements? Thank you. Honorable Minister. There are processes already in the legislation. For those who want exemptions, they are supposed to apply and state their case. It's properly investigated. If it's genuine, if it's genuine, they can be exempted, but if it's not, because they must disclose everything, including their finances, because some of the employers, they want to hide behind this. We're not taking a rigid approach, but we cannot just pass laws and then do not want to implement them. That's our approach. Thank you. Honorable Mentor, you are the next one. Uh, Ngozi House Chair. Uh, Minister, the sectoral bargaining councils, they have no mechanisms to detect exploitation of unskilled labor. Neither they have monitoring skill in terms of the industries they serve in to check what they do and how many they are. Secondly, there is no clear law to protect the infant industries in South Africa, which by far, they employ the bulk of unskilled labor. And that's where you can get more people employed for South Africa. Will your department stop the barbaric actions, in fact, the barbaric bylaws by different municipalities that seeks to destroy the infant industries like the hawks, the hawkers. You find in Johannesburg, I, I, I in Town, up, Mama. the old people I that are selling up, Mama. Your time is up. and everything that are removed Thank by, you. that are removed by JF, Thank the you JFMPD. Very much. And they are removed Thank by you. law enforcement. Your time is up. Also, ma. do you have uh, uh, honorable any relationship member, your with time is up. Business. I'm going to switch off the mic. Um, the the labour laws 
The labor laws are meant to apply to all, to all the employees. However, there are problems in relation to the informal sector. I think the formal sector is properly regulated by the laws. But in the informal sector, there's a problem because some of those employers are not even registered um, with the various or meeting the various what we call conditions which have been put for them. It's something which we have to look into. And, uh, but still, they remain the employers and they must comply if, like the previous question, they want to be exempted. We have to exempt them, but we don't have a special law to protect them because you can't regulate each and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question will come from Umflonisha Uma Mushengwa. Madam House Chair, thank you. Honorable Minister, in light of shifting labor market and imminent fourth industrial revolution, which will the labor market require new and different skills? I would like to know whether your department has planned to ensure that the labor market is adequately supplied with the, dem the demand by South African citizen. I thank you. I think we must, we, we must remember that when we're talking about this fourth industrial um, revolution, there have been revolutions before. The, the first one, which was the industrialization, that was a revolution on its own, which was shifting from the hand to a, a number of other things, steam power and so on. Then there was also a second revolution which started talking about the issue of mechanization and so on and so on. They talked about the third. So this shift is always going to be there. But what is important is we need to talk about the upskilling, the retraining, and the training of the workers. What we must accept, we can't stop the technological changes. So today, you're talking for industrial revolution, which is linked to digitization, automation. You can mention all the other things. But the reality is, we will have to prepare the workers. And I think uh, the Minister of uh, Mining and Energy was talking about a just transition, as long as we ensure that that revolution is also human-centered, we are able to skill our people so that they are able to participate into that. We must, we must accept that we have to invest in our people. For now, you know that uh, Minister of Finance will tell you that our uh, unemployment is mainly structural, linked to uh, the issue of the skills, which means we have to double our efforts in terms of skilling the people, giving them the basic skills, but also giving them the modern skills to face the challenges of the new technologies and so on. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Minister. We now move to question 179, asked by the Honorable Mamudise to the Minister of Environmental Affairs, Mill Forestry and Fisheries. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Honorable Modise. The department is in the process of rolling out a small-scale fisheries sector program, whereby a total of over 10,000 individuals from traditional fishing communities along the coastline of South Africa are currently being granted access to marine resources for commercial and food security purposes through a cooperative model. This right of access is for a duration of 15 years. The details of this program are as follows. 
In 2018, the department allocated the first 15-year small-scale fishing rights to two co-ops in the Northern Cape. On the 19th of October, 2019, I handed over 15-year fishing rights to seven small-scale cooperatives in the Ugo District Municipality of KZN, with 467 declared small-scale fisher people who stand to directly benefit from access to marine resources for commercial and food security purposes. This handover of fishing rights marks the beginning of small-scale rights allocations in KwaZulu-Natal that will see fishing rights granted to over 36 cooperatives involving 2,184 individual fisher people. Next month, in the Eastern Cape, Small-scale fishing cooperatives will be granted small-scale rights. There are 75 cooperatives involved, involving 5,335 individuals. In the Western Cape, small-scale fishing cooperatives have been registered with the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, and they will be assisted to receive their fishing rights by December 2019. With the introduction of the small-scale fisheries sector, the department will provide the necessary support to these fishing cooperatives. As well as allocating fishing rights, this support includes ensuring that the cooperatives are sustainable and looking for ways to improve the value chain and access to markets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Modisa. Thank you, House Chair. Is the minister satisfied about the progress made so far? If not, what are the plans to accelerate the progress made pertaining the transformation of the sector? And also, how will the department assist those indigenous communities living along the oceans to have access to the sector so that they are able to sustain their livelihoods? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much. These rights that I have documented that we're in the process of issuing are intended for indigenous communities that live along the, the coastal sector. Where I think we still have problems with regard to transformation in the fisheries sector is when we look at the commercial fishing rights. And uh, you would know that um, we have a process which is underway at the moment to issue licenses for 12 fisheries that will conclude in 2021. Those are commercial fisheries. And obviously one of the criteria is going to be to support new entrants and to make sure that we continue with the transformation of the sector. Point of order. What is your point of order, Honorable Ndozi? The minister is speaking to us with an earphone. Oh. Is she being told answers from the transition Honorable group? Honorable member. <laughs> Honorable member, no. Why when she's speaking to Honorable she member, to that's not a point of order. I'm going to cut you off. Uh, Honorable uh, Singh, it's your time now. Thank you, my earphones are off. Honorable Chef, Honorable Minister, uh, thank you very much for being in uh, KwaZulu Natal last week, an area where I reside, and handing over those uh, fishing rights to the indigenous community. Now, not even 10 nautical miles north of there, Honorable Minister, our community fishermen, subsistence fishermen, who have been fishing for decades. But there is a move to prevent these people from fishing along this coast for no scientific reasons other than people who have had the privilege of building expensive cottages on the beach in the 80s and 60s and before 1994, I think are preventing people from coming and fishing in front of their homes. So will you give this house an assurance that if there is a ban on fishing or any restriction, it will be based purely on scientific reasons and not on these reasons which are racially based. Thank you. Honorable Minister. Honorable Singh, my understanding is that uh, beaches in this country cannot be privatized by individual property owners. 
It's also my understanding that only the Department of Fisheries can issue fishing rights. So if you have uh, particular individuals who are taking over this function from us, please supply me with their names. We will deal with them. Thank you. The next uh, question will come from Honorable Lorima. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we're conscious of the needs of small-scale fishermen, uh, and we trust that the Minister will not address these by sacrificing resources in the longer term. In this regard, West Coast rock lobster is an important species for small-scale fishermen, and this year's catch has been pegged at last year's levels. Will the Minister make available the recommendations of her scientific working group that set this limit, so that the justification for the latest TAC can be scrutinized? And if she's not going to do that, please, could she tell us why not? Honorable Minister. Honorable Lorimer, you're a member of the Portfolio Committee. You have, uh, you have the right to oversight on anything that the department does. So I can't understand why you think you would be prevented. Thank you. Honorable Paulson will give the last uh, follow-up question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Minister, a quota allocation is only access to the first stage of the fishing value chain. Small-scale fishers, like in areas her like Hermanus, are given an allocation of 200 kilograms of abalone for a season. Abalone internationally costs 8,000 rand per kilo, but a Chinese-owned processing plant in Hermanus pays these small-scale fishers 500 rand per kilo because they've got the facility to clean and to process the abalone. So what is the department doing to assist these small-scale fishers to participate in other phases or stages of the value chain so that they can actually benefit from those 200 kilograms of abalone that they catch? And these Chinese people they have better access to markets than your department. In fact, your department's officials used to sell the abalone that they took from the poachers. Thank you very much. Your time companies. is now expired. Thank you. Honorable Minister. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Paulson. One of the issues that we have to address if we are going to make a meaningful difference to these communities is the issue of access to markets and in particular we have to take out the middle people that in many instances are nothing better than mashonisas and are exploiting these fisher people and exploiting their poverty and locking them in endless cycles of debt. We already have uh, an app that has been developed by a non-governmental organization that aims to link up fisher people directly with markets, with restaurants, and with other people who would be wanting to purchase their products. We are in the process of exploring that option because we think that it is one way in which these small fishing communities can get a better price for their goods. But you're absolutely correct that if we don't focus on the issue of market access, then in fact all we're doing is consigning these people even if they have rights to perpetual poverty. Thank you, Minister. We now move on to question 166, asked by Honorable Milham to the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, the country's reserves were not impacted by the Drone strikes in the facilities in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the limited uh, output of crude oil in Saudi Arabia as a result of the drone strikes also has no impact on the grades and qualities of strategic stock that South Africa maintains uh, since uh, the country only stockpiles. Uh, uh, grades from Nigeria and Iraq. Therefore, the status of the Republic's strategic fuel reserves remains the same as pre-drone strikes on the, on the oil facilities 
in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So it has no impact at all. No, Honorable, I'm, I'm sorry, is the Honorable Melam? Sorry. Thank you, House Chair. I find it very interesting, Minister, that you say that uh, the reserves are Nigerian and Iraqi when 44% of our oil, our crude oil imports in South Africa, come from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The 1996 Energy White Paper mandates that the SFF must hold 90 days supply of feedstock for South Africa's refineries, which is in line with global standards. Then there was a draft strategic fuel stocks policy, which has been under discussion since 2013, and that suggests there should be a 60-day stock holding. Then there's a ministerial directive that says, no, we only need 10.3 million barrels, which is about 18 days cover. But, Minister, the question is this. Given that former Minister Jumat Peterson sold off our strategic reserve, and it's currently sitting in the tanks, I'm well aware of that, but we can't touch it because it's the subject of a court case. So nobody knows who actually owns that. Given that that's the case, what will you do in the event of an emergency requiring the release of the strategic fuel reserve? Honorable Minister. Uh, the question was not about crude oil supply to South Africa. Your question was about strategic stock and was saying to you, uh, we only stockpile grains from Nigeria and Iran. Others are in the sector now. So that means the, the, the stock, the strategic stocks are from the remaining 56% of oil supply. So I, I thought you would understand that if you say Saudi supplies 44%, it doesn't supply 44% of strategic stock. It supplies 44% of crude oil to South Africa. But on stockpiling, we keep the oil from Nigeria and Iran and Iraq. So it is of no effect. I don't think I should answer you on the other strategic pile, the rotation stock that was resolving. We will bring the report to you once we have resolved that matter. It is not the question today. Thank you. No, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Maybe first, Sweetie Babunkati, Sikate. Angas pin do non house, Lababanga Pesha Bafunus Buisela again. The geopolitical balance of forces appears to be unstable, and much of the instability in the world is around the giant energy producing nations. What is the government doing to ensure that the South African economy has security of supply of fuel in order to protect our people from the ebbs and flows? of global energy markets. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister. Quite correct, Honorable Lucifer, that the powerful nations use all of us as pawns in a chessboard. Our starting point in line of defense is to ensure that we look after the interests and needs of our country. Everything else must follow. The biggest mistake we, we can uh, have is to comply and relegate a national interest and needs to the back burner. When we do that, we'll diversify sources of energy to South Africa. We'll get oil from Nigeria, Iraq, uh, Saudi, Angola, so that we don't get stuck at the, uh, at the slightest provocation by any nation. So that's where we are. So we'll maintain that policy uh, and hopefully one day we'll discover our own oil reserves as exploration is happening. 
Stokoze, Mkhoni Shanguma, Skati Nesako. Thanks, uh, House Chair, Deputy Minister, I mean, Honorable Minister. In light of the unfortunate events with regards to the xenophobic and Afrophobic uh, attacks in our country, and one of our crude oil partners, which is Nigeria, has there, has there any, has, has any threat ever been made against the South African government by Nigeria in stopping its export of crude oil to our country? You will notice that uh, since what you describe as xenophobic or afropophobic, uh, that needs a debate on its own to give a definition to that conflict. It needs its own definition in the sense that at the height of that, 12 people died. Only two were non-South Africans, 10 were South Africans. So that means it was xenophobic, was xenophobic against ourselves in the main. So the definition of that incident will need to be redefined properly so that we don't get confused by this issue now. But we took time to send uh, an envoy to Nigeria, which was immediately followed by the state visit by the president of Nigeria, meaning that we're serious about our relationship. We are actually resisting the possibility of our relations being derailed by incidents. Because in the continent, uh, there will be many incidents. If we want to be excited, we can destroy our relationship. So our relationship with Nigeria is on a firm footing. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable Mente, it's your time. Uh, Honorable Minister, you earlier on indicated that there is a report with regards to the pile stock which was sold irregular. I, I want to check up with you. Do we have a proclamation number of the SIU with regards to that? Or do we have an SAPS case number? Because such sales have got elements of thieving. Do we know who did it? Did we lose anything? And how are we recovering it? Honorable uh, Minister. Uh, we have the report. We have the report detailed. We have a sense of who is involved. But when you run with forces of that nature, what you avoid all the time is to put the cut before the horse. You follow steps painstakingly, step by step, and you see, we are pendulo, we are quas. We are pendulo, we are quas. Now, now, we are following each step of the process in that regard. That's why I can confirm to you that there is a report. The case has been reported to the police. The, po the, the, the SIU has taken an interest on it. But as we go through the process, in due course, we'll report to parliament. But we, we, we don't just take unprocessed reports to parliament before we understand why do we bring it here? What is it? What are the outcomes? What are the expectations? Why well, that process, the report is there. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We move to... You want the case number? Hon Honorable Ma <laughs> Minister, we are done with your questions. Honorable uh, Dlamini, Ask the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. That's question 154, Honorable Minister. 154. In dealing with the price of electricity from renewable uh, company, the starting point 
cannot be cancellation of contracts. It's a wrong starting point. Uh, but we are negotiating with suppliers of energy from renewable uh, companies and we're at the same time talking to coal producers to re reduce the prices of supply to ESCO. Now, the reason for that, the reason for that is we think that if we can reduce those prices, because in our investigation we discovered that some of the coal, coal producers make 50, 70, 100% profits. We say we don't want to kill businesses, but we want people to make reasonable profit and get returns from their investment. So in this regard, we're busy with that process, and we are not negotiating cancellation. We are negotiating of adjusting the prices downwards so that we can talk to ESCOM and NERSA to actually give us what we call admission prices by reducing the actual price of ESCOM to the areas of industrialization in the economy. Thank you. Honorable Shibambu will take care of the follow-up question. No, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, I noticed that most DA members are on their earphones listening to the resignation <laughs> of Musumai Man. So let's deal with this question. And the, uh, now, now, Minister, We agree that at the center of ESCOM's crisis is these uh, power purchase agreements. One, you can't underestimate the impact negatively that is causing on the financial stability of ESCOM. And what we raised yesterday about the coal prices. Okay, in terms of coal prices, you see a negotiating. Why don't you just give an instruction that all the coal prices must be consistent with what NERSA has determined? Why, why, why would you want to take forever? Because you are just delaying the crisis, if, if it's going to take the approach that we're taking, it is not going to help you uh, anyhow in terms of uh, what should uh, effectively happen. So the issue is, is, why don't you just comply with the NERSA instructions in terms of coal and then deal with the independent negotiation of power purchase agreements by ESCOM, because ESCOM is not involved now with these IPPs, someone else imposes those contracts on ESCOM, it becomes entirely problematic. It, it causes huge chaos in terms of its financial stability. Can't you take a different approach in terms of how you stabilize uh, ESCOM instead of throwing money like you did yesterday through that nonsensical special appropriation bill? Honorable Minister. Uh, for better part of my life, uh, Honorable Shivambo, I was an activist opposing a government. Now, when you're in opposition, you're opposing a government, you have all the ready answers because you take no responsibility. Now, in our case, we understand that we can't just give instructions in a constitutional democracy. You talk to those producers because ESCOM, ESCOM procured that coal and signed contracts. And what we're intervening at, we say, these contracts are too costly for ESCOM. Can we have a sense of saying, uh, as it was in the, up to the early 90s, where there was price of coal for domestic, which was indexed? and export prices that were also indexed. And at that time, those prices were never the same. We say that practice can be reintroduced, but if you want stability, you do that by engaging the coal producers. The same applies to the IP window one, two, and three. Uh, there was a risk taken to introduce the technology. And our argument is that that risk has been subsidized by the state. Let's talk to one another, agree on reducing it, 
so that the stability in ESCOM, then we can talk of administered prices for customers who are intensive consumers of electricity. We're only strange country that go out there and ask people to consume less of the produce that were produ the products that we're producing. It only happens with ESCOM. And when there is a decline in demand, we think that is a positive development. It's not. Decline in demand of electricity is a sign of deindustrialization. So we're dealing with that with an open mind and we're appreciating the fact that we are not dictatorial, we are managing an economy of the country. Mr. Rose. Uh, Nishwa Milam, you are the next. Thank you, Chairperson. Minister, the IRP that you promulgated on Friday, both the correct and the incorrect versions, identify renewable energy as the least cost option and the quickest to bring online in the short term. In your briefing on Friday, however, you said that you had opted for a low cost option, taking into account other factors. But economic estimates place this at costing South Africa more than 100 billion rand more than that low cost option, the, the, the least cost option. So the low cost option that you're proposing, 100 billion rand more for South Africa than the least cost option. Will you inform this house why you are not in favor of the cheapest and quickest solution to our electricity crisis? Honorable Minister. My first reason is that I'm not a lobbyist for any technology. Uh, well, there you are. I'm not a lobbyist for any technology. That's the first reason. The second one is my understanding of cost effectiveness as not meeting as not meaning literally cheap it means cost effectiveness factors in all the other factors and time that's why when you talk about for example nuclear many of the lobbies for other alternative technologies will always say that nuclear is expensive you have to remind them that Nuclear is expensive at, at commissioning and at decommissioning. When it is operational, it is efficient, it is effective, and it is low cost. So we've published the IRP. It opens up space for entrepreneurs, for everybody who want to play in that space in whatever technology is there. Our preoccupation are two primary preoccupations. The first one is a sustainable and secure supply of energy to the country. And the second one is that we must comply with our commitment to the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Mshwani uh, Shwamalinga, Ms. Karting Esako. Thank you, Honorable House Chair, Honorable Minister. Considering that the cost of renewable energy has declined dramatically in the last decade and renewables form a key element of the non-grid connection to rural areas. What is the government's long-term strategy to procure renewable energy in order to ultimately lower the price of electricity and achieve the NDP target of full electrification by 2030? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Minister. Psalm 121 is giving us a lesson to lift our eyes to the mountains. <coughs> now, now, that approach doesn't work in managing the economy. You don't switch like a pendulum because you are anticipating a lower price into the future. Window one, two, and three are very much expensive, and that is the reality we're dealing with. Window four is kicking in, very reasonable, 108 PV, 80, 87 cents wind. And somebody wanted us to say, we declare that on date X there will be window five. I always tell them that, Actually, there will be window 20. We'll go through all these windows until you reach window 20, window 30. 
But the reality of the matter is that in doing so, you must be systematic and you must follow the logic of security of energy supply for the country. And that's where we are. Thanks, uh, House Chair. Honorable Minister, regarding ESCOM's inability to sufficiently supply continuous electricity over the past decade, I would like to ask the Minister whether government has a plan to stimulate and deregulate the energy sector to allow the, I, the independent power producers entrances in order to promote stability, competition, and spread the risk of power outrages uh, regarding energy supply in South Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, sometimes things you think that everybody notices that. Generation of, of electricity in South Africa is diversified. It's no longer a monopoly of ESCOM. It's no longer a monopoly of ESCOM. Diversified, and our assumption is that that will continue into the future. That's why in the RP, look at the numbers that are provided for. We appreciate the fact that it is going to grow faster than other sources. The RP says so. So just take time, read the RP, so that you can understand that uh, I actually renewables have been given the biggest allocation in terms of growth, though by 2030, coal will still be a dominant source of energy. We have 16 power stations. We are not going to switch them. I don't subscribe to this principle that we must switch all coal power stations and breathe fresh air in darkness. I don't subscribe to that. <laughs> see, we should actually work on the supply and manage the transition. That is what I believe in. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We now move to question 185, asked by the Honorable Mahladze to the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you, Honorable Chair. <coughs> Thanks for the question. The, the objective of the Communal Property Associations Act 1996 is to enable communities to form juristic persons in order to acquire, hold, and manage property on a basis agreed to by members of a community in terms of a written constitution. Whilst economic viability of these entities is essential and desirable, the ultimate measure is whether these entities man manage their affairs, including assets, in accordance with the will of their members. Current mechanisms put in place to ensure sustainability and economic viability. Some CPAs exercise control over substantial assets. The extent to which they exercise good corporate governance and maintain institutional stability tend to have positive results on their economic performance. The department therefore places special focus on the training of executives of the CPAs in good corporate governance. CPAs also have been encouraged to get together at district level to establish district forums that facilitate learning. This approach has had li its limitations and is therefore under review at the moment. CPAs that control substantial resources have had an unfortunate trend of massive conflict amongst members and sometimes between members and their leaders. The department provides specialist mediation services to help CPA members find one another and work together. A lot of resources are therefore invested in this regard. There are instances where either the degree of maladministration and institutional instability render CPAs unable to perform their functions. This sometimes results in the DG, the Director General, pursuant to, to a court order taking over the management of the affairs of a CPA until a degree of 
stability is achieved. Future mechanisms to ensure sustainability. There's collaboration being explored with institutions of higher learning to provide customized training to all willing members of CPAs and effectively in a language that the community understands. The language spoken by the majority of CPA members is identified and CPA founding documents get translated into that particular language in order to encourage effective participation of members in their affairs. In instances where CPAs do not have the necessary infrastructure to keep records, the department in its district offices make available basic CPA documents like constitution, membership lists, et list, etc. Strict enforcement of existing legal mechanisms is un are undertaken to discourage rogue CPA executives from operating in a manner that is inconsistent, inconsistent with the aspirations of the CPA membership. The departmental CPA monitoring capacity is underway to be improved in order to, in order to better understand the needs of CPAs and provide on-time support. Lastly, the possibility of deconsolidating big CPAs that comprise of various communities who do not regard themselves as a single community is being explored. I thank you. Uh, thank you, House Chair. At Deputy Minister, Honorable Deputy Minister, thank you very much for your comprehensive response. However, I hope you will agree with me that the intention of the amendment to the Communal Property Association Act of 1996 was to address many challenges that, ad that the department had experience in implementing the act over the years. These challenges ranging from literacy to capacity in as far as, in as, far as uh, capabilities of CPAs is concerned. In view of the latter, what role will the recent amendment bill play in ensuring effective operations of the CPAs? Thank you. <laughs> the Parliament of the Republic of South Africa, particularly the fifth administration, had been going through the amendments with a very fine comb in order to look at exactly the limitations the honorable member is referring to. And therefore, the current, the, the amendments are specifically to address the limitations that it's trying to, to close all gaps and make sure that there is smooth running. One of the problems that we do have is also the laxity and the, the members themselves not taking serious the period of making sure that <clears throat> the executives do account. I have referred also to the, to, to the fact that the department does on-spot training in relation to these people so that they can better understand. Because you are dealing here with people who are now administering large assets, large quantities of money, and therefore they should be so empowered to understand their role and the fact that the resources are not necessarily theirs. It is for the sake of the general membership of the respective CPAs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mutonisha <laughs> Ungekaranjena 
i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i i Nendo if I am the name, a band of a name. Aba Tibengen, a great long about a bay in my bit, a umsaba, about Tan, the Mongago, a cogger, but perpetual tenemy, Ungono Ubuso the mover, Benegazo, a man. Mthon shot Kulagara Magina is in the Mamma, a good share of Kakasha Abandu, who was a good pair in Labano, not of their own party to Nanga Massape is in your book. Seattle was a Matlaza Tuna. We are born, 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 we are are is no longer is not by is not possible to give people i can make an example for the union buildings and many other areas le point lena to be very honest in this whole period we also have teething problems as a department so i would not say that i call yokuba in other areas, but it is in that regard that I say we are improving on what we are doing based on the history. The truth of the matter, the matter of CPAs has not really been a perfect solution to the problems that, 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 we, 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 that we have. We're trying to solve a problem and also we are kumbula babuti option, whether it's trust or CPA. And the department has got a larger role when it comes to uh, questions of CPAs. But major, major, massive problems are there. And those are the issues I'm referring to, which is training and making sure that our people understand that this is the assets and resources are their own future. They must take care of them and they must respect them, even for generations to come. Thank you, Ahpara Lidstein. Yes, he knows it great. Thank you, uh, Chair. Deputy Minister, I agree with you that communities are sitting on massive resources. My concern is that maybe the department used a very fine comb to look at which, which CPAs actually sit on these mineral resources. And then they use that to block communities to actually form CPAs. And I'm going to ask you a specific question about the Bahatla Bahafela community. For years, Che, uh, they are struggling to form a CPA. And I am quoting the Daily Maverick where they say, under the land that belongs to the Bahatla Bahafela lie the richest platinum deposits on earth. But a toxic alliance between government, traditional chieftaincy, and major mining houses stood in the way of the community to actually get access to their wealth. What is the department doing to ensure that community actually get access to that wealth that they are sitting on? Are you helping or blocking? Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you very much, Honorable Stein. Bahatla Bahafela in the Northwest Province. Let me just indicate to you that when I was speaking about resources, I was not only speaking about mineral resources. I'm speaking about resources in general, including mineral resources. Even the millions that are sitting with CPAs, those are resources that I'm, I'm referring to. Now, let me just quickly say that uh, the issue you are referring to, I fortunately had an opportunity of leading a process of trying to get that CPA, to, uh, that CPA together. It's a very, we can spend the whole day and night. That particular CPA, in fact, when I was referring in my initial answer about a DG given a responsibility to oversee a CPA, that's one example of such a CPA. You know what happened? 
When, when, I went, when I went there to intervene, on arrival, amongst the members themselves, there were not less than four, four entities that called them CPAs, including the traditional authority. There has always been various accusations about issues of corruption from members of the department. I specifically said, please provide us with the, answer, with the names and the evidence. We will investigate and do something about it. I invite you, Honorable State, if you do have such information, please bring it to us and you, you see whether we're not going to take action against such. I thank you. Thank you very much and thank you to all the ministers and deputy ministers for your responses today. And uh, the business of the day is done. Thank you very much. Chair, the house is adjourned. The DA benches are very sad. Very, very sad. Shem. Musi, my man is DA, gone. Musi, gone. Papa, well. It's a sad gone. day for the DA.